and get started um, for our academic half day today. Um, really excited about today's session, uh, the first session of NICSAP Dermatology. Um, we are lucky enough to have Dr. Jessica Wohn and Dr. Roy Colvin joining us and uh, leading today's session. So I'll, I'll turn the virtual podium over to, over to the two of you now. <laughs> Hi everybody, thanks for joining. Um, so we're gonna go through several mix up questions. Um, I'll be moderating the questions and Dr. Colvin will be kind of guiding the discussions, but this is meant to be easy, like kind of relaxed and interactive. Um, I We have eight questions, uh, but about an hour. So we'll just kind of go through as many as we can and then I think uh, the slides will be available. There's notes attached. Um, so hopefully that will help you out if we don't get through everything. Um, so just kind of a little background on why these questions were chosen. Um, I kind of deliberately kind of went through the 86 that were available and made just kind of chose questions that had like the right answer chosen like less than 30% of the time per the answer bank, or maybe there is a 50-50 split between the answers, or maybe some high value topics um, with uh, content that will be useful, not only just for the test, but also clinically, um, and try to stay away from anything that was too guidelines based or kind of specific know-it-all questions, um, just to kind of get more bang for our buck. Um, so what we'll do is I'll kind of read through the questions, any images that are uh, associated, um, I will show you. You'll have a question presented and then there will be a poll so you can see how you and your colleagues answer it. Um, and then there are some sub questions to try to help guide you through the thinking of the question um, in which Dr. Colvin will help lead that discussion and then we'll reveal the answer before moving on. Um, so for question one, um, we have a 22-year-old woman who's been uh, evaluating her for a red itchy rash on her chest, her back, her abdomen, arms, and legs for a week. She notes that there's an area of redness and swelling that comes and goes for 24 hours or less, um, and it comes and goes in different locations. She has no lip, tongue, or throat swelling, can't really remember any new meds, food, or other exposures, and she has no other remarkable medical history. Um, on physical exam, her vital signs are normal. She has no lip or tongue swelling. Her lungs are clear, no wheezes, and she has these skin findings. So um, our question is, which of the following is the most appropriate next diagnostic step? Jess, uh, yeah. you, you might be showing, we seem to have lost your- um, Oh, the slide. The slide. Okay. So just just let me know when the polling's done. I'm going to have to defer looking at the results just to keep the slides on. That's fine. I'll, I just stopped the poll, so I'll share there. For uh, chest x-ray, 4%, CBC with the 56%. 9% for food allergy testing, zero for TFTs, and 31% for no further evaluation. Great. All right. So before we chat about kind of the answer, we'll chat about how we are thinking about the question. So can somebody maybe talk about what, the, what they think the diagnosis is? What are some key clinical features? Um, sorry for the lawnmower in the background. Um, any history and physical exam features you want to focus on? Yeah. 
while those are coming through, can I say a couple of words about uh, general approach to a picture based question? That'd be great. Yeah, and, and this goes for real life too. Um, you know, when possible, and I'm assuming your boards are, are gonna be electronic, right? It's not, you don't do paper tests anymore. Um, and so you, I'm, I'm sure you can flip between history and uh, the image that is presented. But particularly when you're, I think it goes for any image. Uh, if you get the chance to look at the image before you read the stem uh, or even the choices and, and you know, good test taking, sometimes they say, read the choices first and then go back and you know, see if you can anticipate what the question it, you know, is, is about. But looking at the uh, image first, uh, it's a good habit in real life as well, then you don't get this adulterating information and whether or not the, the question stems throwing you any red herrings. Um, yeah, so, I mean, here you have, um, you know, this lacy uh, kind of interconnecting, uh, I don't want to see network because you're going to think automatically of something libido, right? So if I say that, I don't want to use that word. Um, but I mean, you get round and 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 arcuate and semicircular shapes, okay. Uh, and as you look in that, that you're you're, you're going to generate your own differential diagnosis, and you're going to want to key in on probably, you know, is this persistent or is it transient? Because I think somewhere in there, I, th I saw a little bit of reticularis as a choice. I think that's a great idea. Um, but you want to you know know does this uh, is this kind of come and go quickly, um, to, which is gonna get at the, the real answer really quite quickly. Uh, and, and you're given that in the STEM. So you, you already have that thought in your head and then you confirm it by reading the STEM next. So uh, that, that will help you to anticipate the, the, the point of the question. Anybody want to venture kind of what the diagnosis may be here? There's a couple of answers in the chat. Um, Livido was mentioned, chronic urticaria, erythema multiforme was mentioned as well. Great. And Jessica, you may want to go back to the the stem of the the or the history and physical part just to, to re kind of confirm yeah. some of those things and see if you pick out things here that might help with that differential, which I think is really good. Um, and um, you know, young person, you know, basically young well person uh, out of the blue. Um, and there you have the kind of I think maybe the the crux of the of the diagnostic question is you know coming and going less than 24 hours and then it's not associated with angioedema so no lip swelling no, no throat problems um and then basically this kind of zilch for any contributory history uh and a normal physical exam otherwise right Any other commentary? Another vote for uh, chronic urticaria. Yeah, good point too. And but this history doesn't go back very far, right? It was fairly recent, a couple of weeks. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, yeah. Of... So, I, I, um, remind me again what the what the time course was. Was it two weeks? I think it's just one week. Yeah. One week. Yeah. So we're we're not so chronic yet, right? Uh, and we're still. I mean, it's not like acute in that it came on an hour ago, but it's it's been going on for a week. Uh, so we're not yet to that chronic phase. Which, uh, if, if we're talking about urticaria, and I think we're we're kind of getting down to that. Uh, the difference between acute and chronic is six weeks. Uh, and so in this time we're, and that makes a difference because um, not that you're going to necessarily get at a diagnosis once it reaches six weeks, but, you know, acute, a very common condition 
happens in you know a lot of people that are perfectly well, and we often don't explain it, mm. uh, and and so sort of that that gets to like the the real you know what test should you order kind of thing. Well, um, more than half of you thought it was a CDC seems reasonable and you know usually helpful, uh, and then it kind of and then a few ray and then it was like no further evaluation for a good chunk of you um so let's go ahead to the answer and then maybe if we have any further questions so it's actually interesting our spread was very similar um dr colvin any further thoughts yeah it, you know again an, another sort of you know test takers thing it's a question about kind of resource allocation and and using you know should you spend any money on this evaluation or any lab money uh on this evaluation and uh i think the point is is that this is a really common scenario to come up uh you end up having to sort of treat symptomatically and reassuring the patient and telling them that this is going to go away and you don't need to kind of go digging for an underlying cause because you're unlikely to find it. Um, and that's, um, uh, you know, our, 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 our tendency as, as internists is to kind of go, go looking for trouble. And in this case, there really isn't much trouble to find. Uh, and, and, and more, more or less it's reassurance, you know, symptomatic therapy, usually, you know, and oral antihistamines. And, you know, sometimes I think it can be a little bit hard, you know, test questions are aiming for a certain goal, but real life happens a little differently. Um, what would you counsel this patient if you saw her in clinic? Um, say it went on for six and a half weeks. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it still wouldn't, um, in my mind, bode trouble. It just means it's going to be maybe more problematic. And again, the vast majority of Urticaria that comes out of the blue is going to disappear back into the blue, but you never know necessarily when that's going to happen. Uh, and you're know, taking a good medication history and making sure that you, you know, try to account for all things that the patient may not consider as a medication. So over the counter things, just make sure there's that is not stepping in. Uh, and and then you know you, you might say, well, what could have triggered this? Could the person have had a URI or something? viral that might have uh, set this off, but most of the time you come up pretty empty handed. Um, and so it's, it's, this is usually not the, even when it goes on chronically, the harbinger of, of, of something bad, uh, a new autoimmune condition or rheumatologic condition or something like that. Cool, thank you so much. Yeah. All right, let's move on to the next question. Um, are there any other questions that I can't see. <laughs> Here's, uh, I'll just say with this for, uh, I kind of learned this from allergy colleagues. Uh, um, you know, obviously Benadryl is something patients reach for quite quickly. And it's, you know, I think it's a horrible medication. If you've ever taken it, it just makes you sleepy and dry mouth and useless. Uh, but this is usually tr best treated with non less sedating antihistamines mm -hmm. um, like, you know, loratadine or cetirizine, for example. Uh, but what most people don't think to do is to push that pretty much a lot higher than what's recommended. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, the label says dose steerzine once every 24 hours. You know, you can push that up to twice that dose every 12 hours. So you can oh, go wow. to four times the dose and be perfectly fine. And I had a patient who hit a new record, which was 12 steerzine in a day. And I thought, you're probably not really getting anything out of those extra eight. Uh, so, um, but she was sitting there talking to us and standing, so it wasn't a problem. But just, yeah. So you in even in a young, healthy person, you're not going to start with four in a 24 hour period, but you can, you can pretty rapidly get up to that and it, it can make a difference. Thank you. That's impressive. <laughs> Okay. Yes, may I just ask for you to just quickly differentiate uh, libido reticularis versus yeah. urticaria, and then sure. kind of how we would think of like going through that, just because that seems like yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a good point. Uh, yeah, I mean, this looks very net-like. Uh, 
I think the, the clue to me is, um, so Livator tends to be kind of a lower extremity predominant thing. And I think that's kind of the way, you know, circulatory issues work in the lower parts of one's body. Uh, the transient nature of this is also really helpful for urticaria. Uh, I think itch was mentioned, which would not be a feature of Livido reticularis. Uh, so itch, transient. The other thing is that this uh, typically is um, um, erythematous, means it blanches with pressure. I don't think we, I know we got that on exam, no. but, but in, in real life, you, you, you can see that. And um, uh, yeah, so kind of widespread distribution, itch, um, more central nature of it, as opposed to being on the lower extremities predominantly. Um, yeah, so physiologic libido, like cold responsive libido would not present like this. It would be something the patient has known about for a long time. And that does change with position. Um, this is coming and going randomly uh, on its kind of on its own without any sort of position change. So that that would be helpful. That's great. Thanks so much. And then let me say, I got to say one more thing. Um, urticarial vasculitis would be one thing you keep in the back of your mind if you had a similar picture, but with persistence of lesions. And mm -hmm. often you get a bit of a dusky center in the middle of these uh, rings. Uh, and and that is, you know, that's something that can be associated with rheumatologic conditions and where actually CBC or complement levels might be helpful for making that diagnosis. But this is not that. This is this is too transient to be urticarial vasculitis. Okay. So question two, we have a 70 year old woman. She's had a three week history of painful non-healing ulcers on her lower extremity. Uh, sorry, one ulcer. It was initially nodular, then expanded and developed central ulceration. She has ulcerative colitis, stasis colectomy, severe osteoporosis, and poorly controlled type 2 diabetes. She's on glargine, lispro, metformin, atorvastatin, aspirin, alendronate. On exam, her vitals are normal. She has a 3 to 4 centimeter ulcerated lesion on the inner aspect of her lower extremity, and I'll show the picture next. There's no edema, edema. her pulses are normal. Uh, no white count, elevated ESR at 50, and hemoglobin A1C of 8.5%. And she actually got a biopsy that had dermal necrosis and steroneutrophilia. And we'll come back to the image, but we'll move on to the question. So which of the following is the most appropriate treatment? Oral cyclosporine, oral prednisolone, referral to vascular surgery or a topical steroid. About 50% of people have voted, so I'll give another 10 seconds. Okay. Okay, so the poll is closed. Um, uh, for the oral cyclosporine, it was 26%. The winner was oral prednisolone at 46%, 9% with vascular surgery referral, and 20% with a topical corticosteroid. Great. Okay, so kind of reflecting on the question, um, if somebody wants to chat about what they think the diagnosis is, kind of. Um, sort of leading question a little bit, but what are your top two treatment choices and which would you choose and why? It's a great example of a, you know, question where um, you're gonna look and you go, oh, I know what this is. Um, but then the question is about the diagnosis. It's not what is the diagnosis. So now, now right. it's, 
getting to a separate level. Um, the, this is one again where you can look at the um, image first. Um, I, I describe this as a cheese pizza leg ulcer. Okay, oh. sorry, sorry to ruin pizza for you. Um, and it, with, with, you know, which looks very inflammatory. So, you know, not your, uh, uh, you know, typical kind of well granulating like venous ulcer. It's a little bit on the, uh, the lowish side for that, but it could be. It's in the differential. <laughs> and um, yeah, so uh, I mean, the official dermatologic term for cheese pizza, well, uh, this would be ulcer would be the kind of morphologic, you know, descriptor. Uh, ulcer with, um, you know, and a necrotic with necrotic portions, of a raised edge. It's not necessarily a rolled border. Mm -hmm. And then the, I think the other thing you start to appreciate here, and it's uh, kind of a um, classic description of a pyoderma gangrenosum ulcer, is uh, cribiform scarring. In other mm -hmm. words, the it's got all the elements to heal it's you don't see the cribiform kind of plate appearance here but at the sort of at the four o'clock edge of this thing you see that there's kind of a tongue of epithelium trying to close this thing all the mm -hmm. elements are there for healing but you've got this inflammatory impediment that is working against you so just as quickly as one's healing these ulcers you're breaking down again so that's why you often get like uh, a partially healed ulcer with little like potholes of inflammation within that that scarring. That's why that cribiform scarring description comes in. All these areas. Yeah. Hmm. And then and then in the stem they give you you know the fact the reason why it's not a venous ulcer. So you know um, pulses are good. So it's not arterial ulcer. No lower extremity edema, and you don't really see really chronic venous uh, changes. Uh, and the position is okay for uh, venous ulcer, but it's 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 not also you know uh, board question perfect. Uh, and then the other thing given about the stem is you know the the red flag of like um, this person's got uncontrolled diabetes. Um, you know, prednisolone is going to be complicated, so um, you know you got to got to think. Well, are the other choices any better? Mm -hmm. And in my mind, the 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 Two things that I would use to treat this at, in this patient are not on this list. Um, so, but uh, so it's forcing you to think about, okay, okay can, you know, are, is, is anything else going to be, be useful? Any thoughts from the team? There's a good question about healing and breakdown. Uh, yeah, it's that's right. I mean, it could be that there is some, uh, you know, in, in internal pathology going on in the same wound. It may be that it's. Uh, I mean, they, when uncontrolled, these things do tend to start from like a kind of a necrotic breakdown, almost like a almost like a small abscess or a big zit that then breaks down into this like ugly ulcer fairly quickly. So the coming and going may have to do with pathology. I don't know. It's a good thought. Yeah. So my initial treatment for this, which isn't on the list, would be um, intralesional steroids. Yeah. Uh, so injecting triencinolone or kenalog into the um, the throughout the ulcer, uh, and then also using you know good uh, sort of mo moist wound healing techniques and maybe even a bit of mild compression. And I know this is not um, uh, a venous ulcer, but um, compression often helps in uh, sort of mobilizing, you know, edema that may be right around the wound uh, and, and usually enhances healing. It also tends to, you know, make the wound feel a little bit better when it's, when it's covered and it's covered with something that isn't sticking to the wound. Mm -hmm. So something like Telfa applied over the uh, surface a um, little bit of um, you know gauze padding to absorb any uh, moisture that comes across, and then real gentle compression. Um, right. I um, I I know I knew what the answer is supposed to be here. Um, I I actually put D as the next best answer for for me, 
And part of that is just the last year I've been trying to avoid <laughs> immunosuppressive agents. Uh, and cyclist born in a 70 something year old diabetic, uh, I'm not feeling very good about. <laughs> um, and so, you know, my first choice would have been intralesional. My second choice might have been uh, a TNF alpha inhibitor like infliximab or um, adalimumab um, as, as next choice. And, you know, prednisone is sort of what's given as the, you know, sort of first line therapy. But here you have a complication uh, likely to happen if you throw. Uh, a higher dose prednisolone in. So it, it, cyclosporin is, is effective for pyoderma gangrenosum. And often when you're trying to get quick uh, um, um, control, uh, you'll, you'll start with often IV prednisolone if it's really bad or oral prednisone, and then quickly um, add cyclosporin to try to, um, as, your, as your steroid, as your steroid sparing agent, um, to get them off prednisone as quickly as you can. All right. Um, so, yes. Um, again, test questions versus real life. Um, I think it's good to discuss that. Um, but uh, as Dr. Colvin said, uh, they preferred cyclosporine here. Um, in the setting of diabetes. Okay, yeah, and, any, yeah. any last comments? <laughs> Dr. Cho asked a question, you know, could this be done in a primary care office? Absolutely. Uh, you know, you may, you may not feel super comfortable about doing it the first time, but if someone coached you through it once, it's gonna need repeated intralesional injection, like even on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. uh, but once seeing it done, it, yeah, it's not super comfortable. It's, it, they're typically painful ulcers, but, um, Intralesional steroid is not in itself a very irritating, and you're not putting a ton of volume in there, so it's it's often tolerated pretty well. You can go pretty quickly with it. Great. And are there um, just for my knowledge, are there predilections on the body in which pyoderma granulosum occurs? I mean, we yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah. That's a good point. Tends to be tends to be lower extremities uh, first. Um, and, um, but you know, not always, it, it can be pretty random. Um, and it, and it can be just one ulcer and which makes it kind of can you confusing to distinguish it from, uh, a venous ulcer sometimes when you have that location and one, one lesion. Um, but the history is usually, you know, kind of my, minor trauma or no trauma, no history of edema and this thing breaking down quickly uh, and, and pain is, is typical. It's, uh, it's quite, quite painful, as you can imagine. Hmm. Great, thank you. All right, next question we've got is a 35 year old woman who's had a six month history of skin changes on her legs. She noted some scaling and thickening of her skin on their anterior shins. So she's tried moisturizers and topical steroids and hasn't helped. Uh, she came into a clinic three months ago, uh, gave her antifungals and more topical glucocorticoids without any effect. Um, and these areas continue to thicken. She's had type one diabetes, hyperthyroidism, vitiligo. She's not taking glarging and methimazole. Um, her vital signs are shown a pretty normal blood pressure and uh, temperature, slightly heart, higher heart rates. Um, her BMI is 19, um, and her thyroid is diffusely enlarged, no nodularity, and no other signs on physical exam, and her skin findings are here. We'll come back to that after I show you the question. Um, so which is the folks most uh, likely diagnosis, lipodermatous sclerosis, necrobiosis, lipoidica, uh, pretubial myxedema, or stasis dermatitis. I think the poll shows the choices. So I'll go back to the picture. Can you also just briefly go back to the, um, uh, the gym? Oh, sure.
And just let me know toggling because um, I can only hear you. I can't see anything else. So less than half of people voting. We'll give another 10, 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. I muted. Uh, so the answer choices looks like a 59% of people voted for A, 8% uh, for B, 20% for C, 12% for D. Great. All right. Uh, Dr. Coleman, do you mind kind of, I have yeah. some images we can use as examples. I don't yeah. know if we could talk through them or show them as well. Let's go back to the picture again, um, it, the, the, the real picture. Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, you've got um, legs in what appears to be a patient of color. Uh, and, you know, I see red, a lot of kind of doughy infiltration uh, without much breakdown of the skin. There might be a little bit in a couple spots. Um, the right leg looks worse than the left. Um, I mean, I, um, there are a couple other things that are interesting to think about, depending on where you place this patient. Uh, if this person were in Sub-Saharan Africa, you would think of um, a um, lymphangio, what do I want to say, lymphangetic uh, Kaposi sarcoma would be in there, both either endemic or epidemic KS. Hmm. Uh, and then the other thing, which uh, would probably fall under stasis, Derm or stasis, that was in, was that one of the choices? Uh, the fourth yeah. one? Yep. Yeah. Would be, yeah, um, something called elephantiasis varicosa nostra. Uh, and if, you know, if you want to go even further, uh, you can stay in the same sub Saharan uh, region and go with uh, filarial elephantiasis. That wouldn't be a, a, um, a bad picture for that either. So there's some, you know, interesting conditions that we'll, you know, to think about, but we're, we're probably back in somewhere in North America or Western Europe or something like that. Uh, and um, so we've got the four choices given. I'm curious if, if many of you chose lipodermatosclerosis and you, you've you heard of that and understand what it is. Because it seems like, you know, that, uh, uh, one that you might fall into going, hmm, I should know about that. I think I've heard of it, <laughs> so I'll choose that one um, because in this case, the uh, the stem is like painting a, a picture for you. Uh, yeah, good. I don't understand what it is either, uh, Nick. So, um, so the stem is you know giving you the history of 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 autoimmune problems. Okay, uh, you got type one diabetes, you got vitiligo, you got some kind of hyperthyroidism, and on the exam you get a diffusely enlarged thyroid. So you're kind of thinking more like Graves' disease. Um, and um, so you're you're given some some fairly fairly big clues there. Um, you got someone who has a relatively normal BMI, uh, maybe even maybe even on the thinner side, and uh, you you know you makes you begin to wonder. And then this person's being treated with methimazole, presumably for for thyrotoxicosis or hyperthyroidism. So um, that so that let's go back to the choices again. Um, yeah, so you got this thing that you know you may have heard of, you don't understand. Necrobiosis lipoidica, we've often heard of associated with diabetes, and it, and it is. Um, Pretable myxedema, which um, you know, the term myxedema is confusing, particularly in the setting of thyroid disease, because uh, you know, you think of one one type of myxedema associated with hyperthyroidism, another type of myxedema associated with hypothyroidism. You know what? What? Which one is it? And then stasis dermatitis 
you know, this seems like a little bit much for, for that. Um, so the stem, I think, helps narrow it down to um, choice C, though a lot of you like the lipodermatic sclerosis mainly because there might be this kind of poor understanding of what that really is. And really, no one truly understands what it is, but it isn't associated with thyroid disease. Can you talk a little bit about uh, hyper and hypothyroidism and the differences? Yeah, in the yeah good. That's, that is uh, often a, a, a easy thing to get mixed up on. Um, so uh, when someone has profound, long-standing hypothyroidism, they can become generally myxedematous, okay? That doughy skin that you, you've you probably never seen because you know most people don't get that profoundly hypothyroid um, nowadays. Uh, and, and myxedema, which is a kind of more of a um, histologist term to indicate uh, the presence of mucin within the tissues, okay? So with somehow hypothyroidism, when profound and prolonged, uh, can lead to widespread doughy myxedematous skin. Um, hyperthyroidism, particularly Graves' disease, can present with this pretibial myxedema as well as uh, exophthalmos, and it's the same infiltration of that um, ground substance in those tissues that creates protruding globes and this um, infiltrative look on the on the legs and and really not anywhere else. You don't get this happening in other parts of the body. And, you know, again, is that a circulatory thing or whatever, but it's, it's, um, it just happens here. So pre myxedema, think of Graves' disease. Mm -hmm. uh, generalized myxedema, think of hypothyroidism of whatever cause, but usually longstanding and, and very um, severe. That's super helpful. So you might look, uh, go to the pictures that you uh, put together mm -hmm. um, just to kind of show examples. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, um, so this, this, I think the left-hand picture where you see kind of red legs with a kind of a, you know, these are described as champagne glass legs or champagne flute legs uh, where you've got this, um, fibrosis and binding down of tissue and the lower half of each leg uh, and then the kind of the normal calf or actually maybe even edema pushed above it and that's why you get sort of an expansion there. This would be the look of lipodermatosclerosis which um, that and its relationship to venous hypertension and venous stasis is all probably part of a similar process. Um, so people can have venous stasis dermatitis and not develop lipodermatosclerosis without the binding down. That the yeah, lower right-hand picture is, I think, supposed to represent venous stasis, uh, which would be more of a you know superficial process, eczematous appearing skin, maybe weepy, cracking, um, often in the setting of chronic edema. Uh, and I would say that this person in the lower right might even have some early lipodermatosclerosis because it looks like it's binding down closer to the ankles. Right. The middle picture is showing you that atrophic, yellowish looking inflammatory plaque that can break down into ulcers. And that's the picture of uh, necrobiosis lipoidica, um, used to be known as NLD or necrobiosis lipoidica diabetic horn, uh, because it was felt to be predominantly associated with diabetes. And it is associated with diabetes, but it can happen outside of diabetes too. Mm -hmm. um, there's not a great understanding of this condition either, um, but it's got a very characteristic look and that atrophy giving you that sort of uh, yellowish background appearance because you're seeing the sub Q fat more easily through the atrophic skin is why you're getting this. Um, again, um, uh, legs are predominant uh, place. Again, similar reason probably for why PG shows up down there for whatever reason, circulatory, disadvantage or something. Hmm. I think the upper right picture is supposed to show pre myxedema again in a different person. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah. Any questions on that from anybody?
Yeah. All good. Right. Yeah. Thanks. And thanks for sharing your thoughts about why you chose uh, uh, something, and it, it's um, it's helpful. Yeah. I think uh, that lipodermatosclerosis thing, that champagne flute thing, I think that's real, uh, and I would I would kind of latch latch onto that as a as a helpful mnemonic, um, and um, and and without the nodularity. Nodularity means something's getting forced into that. And that name, lipodermatous courses, is horrible. Um, but it's really, I guess, talking about fat skin scarring. You know, that's what that's the kind of uh, <laughs> saying. Uh, and that may may sort of jog your memory as to this conversation. Cool. All right. So we're at about 9.45. Um, I'm fine blurring into the 10.10, but people might want to break. So just, just let me know. Um, we're about almost halfway through. Um, this I think is a good question. So we have a 53 year old gentleman. Uh, he's been having an itch for five months. He says his whole body's itchy. He's tried all these creams and antihistamines and it's not feeling better. He otherwise feels well, doesn't have any fever, fatigue, unintentional weight loss, doesn't take any meds, vitals are normal. He's got no lesions on his skin. Um, he's got some excoriations from scratching. Um, thyroid and lymph node examinations are normal. His kind of, <clears throat> kind of initial labs with the CBC, metabolic profile, uh, TFTs, um, liver function tests, and HIV antibody assay are normal. So there's no picture, so we'll just jump into questions. So what is the following um, next best step in his management? A chest X-ray, a CT scan of his chest, abdomen, and pelvis, a skin biopsy, or no further testing? Some requests to go back to the question stem, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Just about a third of people voting now, so another 15 seconds or so. Sure. So poll is closed. Um, looks like most people chose no further testing with 61%. Chest X-ray was 11%. CT was seven. Skin biopsy 22, and then 61% for D. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I think we'll focus on these questions. What's the primary symptom, and what are some of the key reassuring concern features of this vignette, and anything that Dr. Colvin kind of wants to highlight. Yeah, so this is your um, kind of uh, itch without rash, um, or parent rash anyway, uh, question. Um, comes up a lot. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, I, I, I knew the answer for this, but I, I actually answered what I would do in real life, which was no <laughs> further testing. <laughs> uh, and, and maybe some further questioning, because um, a lot of times more way more often than a systemic disease causing itch without a rash is uh, subtly dry skin or maybe even a, a subtly an atopic individual. Um, and so you need to sort of ask those questions specifically. And it's really remarkable, and I, this, is, this may sound weird, but uh, I'm always astounded by when I, I ask patients, tell me, tell me what you do to clean your skin when you get in the shower or bath. Uh, and th they kind of look at me and go, well, like I put soap on and I, you know, rinse and dry. And I said, well, you know, tell me how you apply your soap and, and, uh, you know, 
what do you use, et cetera. And it, it's really remarkable. I think, and if you just if you think to yourself how you would answer that question, but most people have been doing the same thing most of their lives since they've been washing themselves and they get in the shower and they put on a ton of soap uh, and then they rinse. And then some people re-lather, okay? I'm not saying there's, that's weird, but just a lot of people do that. And then some people do that again at the other end of the day, they shower and they lather once or twice all over their body. So when you get wow. into this time of the year towards the end of winter, uh, you get some people that are quite itchy <laughs> because their skin is really dry because they've been drying it out. Um, so yeah, you should, you should question your own showery habits. <laughs> um, so yeah, mo a lot of time itchy skin is really due to dry skin, whether it's overtly scaly dry to your examination or, uh, or, or, or not. So that, that, that's the more practical thing is, is ask that question and then ask, did you have sensitive skin as a kid? Did you have asthma? Did you have, have you had allergies over the years? Uh, and do you have a family history of any of those things? So just, you know, and you'll find, you'll, you'll dig up quite a few atopics that way, uh, but just by asking those questions. Um, but that's not truly the point of this question. The question is, okay, here's a guy without B symptoms. Uh, and do we, another, again, resource allocation uh, question is, uh, uh, you know, should we be spending more money on this? Uh, and, you know, without, you know, again, doing those other things to kind of at least maybe even try a trial of moisturizing uh, and assuring that that person is not over drying their skin. Um, I wouldn't jump right into a scan, an x-ray or, and certainly not a skin biopsy. Um, so I agree with those that answered D. Uh, also, if you had put this question before the very first question where we had another resource allocation question, it might have altered your, your answering of that question too. So, you know, uh, again, you, it, you often get um, influenced by, by previous questions. Can uh, I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, are there any like secret cancers that present with itch with that rash or will they, yeah. Yes. I guess that's probably why some of us chose imaging was that yeah. we felt like. No, and, and, and you're gonna find that some of you if you chose one of those imaging questions, got the answer right. Because yes, um, typically hematologic malignancies and lymphomas and especially Hodgkin's lymphoma. And, uh, and when I've talked about this subject, uh, when I've given talks to you all in the past, um, I, I have a similar thing. And I, and I got, you know, I was caught off guard by a patient who ended up having Hodgkin's lymphoma and which we diagnosed initially from a chest x-ray, but it wasn't you know, we treated his itch for a period of time first, then it just was not responding. And then, and then it was like time to do an x-ray. Um, so first meeting, I'm not sure I would order an x-ray, but, um, but I might consider it beyond that. It's, it's pretty unusual. You know, if you've got itch, there's usually other symptoms too, some weight loss, some B symptoms, something going on. Um, yeah, so that's the answer. Uh, the correct answer in this case is, is an X-ray as as opposed to starting out with a CT scan of chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Um, skin biopsy rarely could get you somewhere, uh, but it would typically be in a much older person, and th and that's someone who's going to especially be affected by dry skin and just a age-related tendency to get itchier as you get older. Uh, sometimes you can uncover uh, things like bullous pemphigoid from a sort of blind, no lesion. Uh, biopsy doing, you know, for sent for immunofluorescence. Hmm. Any other questions? This is great. Okay, let's see if we can fit maybe one or two more questions in if people are willing. Um, so we have a 20 year old gentleman, new scathing rash in the trunk. He's been well until three weeks ago. He had subjective fever for two days, cough, rhinitis that resolved, no issues um, there. And then a week later, um, so I guess two weeks after he had symptoms, he had a spot on his right shoulder. Now the rash has spread to his entire trunk and proximal extremities, no genital lesions, Past medical is unremarkable, takes no meds, and is sexually active. 
Um, on physical exams, vital signs are normal, no oral general lesions, otherwise exam is unremarkable, and this is his uh, rash. So I'll come back to the question, uh, the picture, um, but what is the appropriate um, uh, management for this gentleman? Hep C virus antibody testing, PCR uh, testing, plasma, uh, RPR, or no further evaluation. Will you go back to the question stem, please? Of course. But half of people voting right now, another few seconds. All right, uh, uh, poll is closed. We have 11% for uh, hepatitis C, 26% for B, 21% for C, and then D was the winner with 43%. Right. Okay, so I think some questions that can help with this answer is what is this rash and kind of what part of the history and physical can I help determine your next steps in management? So Dr. Coleman, I'll go back to this rash. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I, I think some, some people are chiming in, uh, and I think you're nailing the correct diagnosis of um, pityriasis rosea, uh, and you caught on to the so-called herald patch that, uh, you know, a spot that comes up, oh, uh, you know, day, even days before the rest of the rash. You're not getting the great Christmas tree pattern here because they're showing you the, the lateral trunk. But if you sort of extrapolate this and turn the patient around in your mind, you would see that that, that, that pattern of the long axis of those oval shapes would be in this Christmas tree pattern. Here it's you know, on, the, on the front, on the uh, anterior side of the trunk, it would be sort of an inverted Christmas tree. So yeah, you're seeing the kind of long axis of all of these lining up in basically the same direction uh, on the trunk, which would have corresponded to a Christmas tree pattern if the patient were turned with uh, his back towards you. Uh, right, so this is a good, good picture for PR. And, um, you know, the question is, you know, is, is there enough going on? Is this, uh, it, do we need to rule out anything else uh, with, with any testing here? And that's what you're, you're given. Um, and uh, again, uh, the correct answer for a test uh, is likely to do an RPR because secondary syphilis can look a lot like um, pityriasis rosea. Um, and uh, taking a good history is helpful. Uh, you know, clearly if this patient were in King County and you, if you took a more detailed sexual history, it was a man who had sex with men, you, you would do an RPR in a moment's notice uh, just because of that, that uh, that demographic uh, and at, and King County being a relative hotbed of syphilis. Uh, on the other hand, uh, get age or slightly different, or uh, you know, a single sexual partner and no you know suspicion. You you might not because you have such a clear history of something that appeared ahead of time, and then and you, the appearance of a very typical rash. So in in real life, you may or may not do uh, an RPR depending on what you know 
what history is given to you. Um, people with secondary syphilis tend to be ill, uh, though not, not uniformly. Uh, this person was ill a bit before uh, the uh, onset of the rash, and that is a history that you'll often get with, with PR because there's an association, and I'm not sure what this association has to do with uh, you know, two days of subject, subjective fever, cough, and, and rhinitis, but there's an association with um, human herpes six and seven with mm. pityriasis rosea. And it's, it's, they're, they're both uh, conditions or viruses looking for, you know, uh, looking to connect with the other. Uh, some human herpes are, are looking for a disease and PR is looking for a virus. So, it, um, but it's not been super conclusive about <laughs> causality there. Great, thank you. Any other questions on this one? Full disclosure, I had PR when I was a first year medical student uh, and went to the you know, campus health center and I got an RPR. <laughs> All right, now we'll remember that answer. Uh... <laughs> That's right. <laughs> EMI, sorry about that. Uh, okay, thank you so much. Uh, let's move on. This will be good. Um, so, 44 year old woman evaluated for two year history of hair loss. Uh, start at the top of her scalp, but not really on the sides of the back. Her brother and father have uh, bald spots, but she states that her mom and grandma are fine. Um, pretty much the only thing significant on exam is this photo. I'll come back to it. Um, uh, so what is the following uh, most likely cause of the patient's alopecia? Alopecia areata, androgenetic, fibrosing, or telogen effluvium? Sorry, will you go back to the question stem one more time, please? Yep. Give another 10 seconds or so for people to answer. Okay, um, so the poll is closed. We have 18% uh, uh, for A, 53% for B, 9% C, 20% D. Great. Um, so maybe we could just talk uh, kind of briefly about key similar and defining features of each. Uh, Dr. Corbin, I have some prepared images if you want to go straight to that or just talk about it verbally. Uh, sure, yeah. No, I think, I mean, well done on the answers because I think uh, the majority okay. answered correctly. Uh, and, um, you know, I think what's limiting about this, and maybe go back to the uh, question image first, uh, Jessica, so we can, so, I mean, it's hard. You, you can see that there is a widened part uh, in this woman's hair and her hair looks diffusely thin where they're showing you the scalp. Okay. But you can't tell. You know, the other thing you can see here, especially where there's light shine right in the center of that part, is you can see her um, hair follicle openings, her follicular ostea, and they seem to be intact and there seems to be hairs associated with them. So um, there doesn't seem to be scarring or fibrosis uh, going on here. And that's where that front, you know, I think no one would ever ask you uh, to diagnose a scarring alopecia. So anything that in a question like this, if, if you have something like frontal fibrosing alopecia, you know, that is not gonna be the right answer. Um, so here you have a non-scarring alopecia, which is where the major branch point is initially for, um, for 
working up uh, uh, hair loss is whether you've got a scarring process or non-scarring process. And by, by looking at the scalp, you've got a non-scarring process. You can't tell, however, from this picture that this um, lack of density of her hair or, or, or less dense uh, hair is, is not all over her scalp, which would really put you more into a telogen effluvium category just by, by picture. Um, but, it, but this is all you get. Um, so you got to make, make the best choice you can. And, and I think you managed to. The family history is, is pretty vague, um, as it often is. Uh, it, you know, it's it, remarkable to me when, when um, men and women who come to our clinic for androgenetic alopecia, they, they often um, at least depict themselves, unless you're saying it's not true, they depict themselves as being the only person in the family with any kind of hair loss whatsoever, which I, I think if I went to their family reunion, I don't think I'd find the same thing. Um, the other thing is that mothers and grandmothers tend to hide their androgenetic alopecia quite, uh, quite well, um, either with volumizing hair or they go to the you know, beauty shop and get sort of a, you know, a puffy sort of uh, hairdo. And that often you know, gets, them, gets them through. Uh, without anyone thinking that their hair is thinning. Uh, women and men differ in how they lose hair in androgenetic alopecia. So hairline recession is typical in men. Uh, hair, frontal hairline preservation is typical in women. Uh, you don't tend to get uh, excessive vertex thinning. So the top of the crown here in women as men often do. Uh, so he, this is a pretty good picture of that alopecia for what's shown, you get that sort of parietal scalp, uh, general thinning and with preservation on the sides and back. And that's, that's where another picture would have been maybe helpful to see that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and then um, the frontal hairline here is more or less preserved. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's a good picture and with, with or without the family history because that can sometimes be somewhat faulty. And maybe we can talk about the different kinds of alopecia, maybe. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So, I mean, this um, upper left corner with this um, a man with with patchy alopecia, um, most likely alopecia areata with multiple non-scarring uh, areas of involvement. Though, if you look at this and think about the sort of classic description of moth-eaten alopecia with secondary syphilis. That kind of looks moth-eaten to me. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's supposed to depict alopecia areata. Um, the, um, I think the upper right is possibly showing frontal fibrosine alopecia. It's a little bit hard to tell from this. This one. Oh, it is? Okay. The, yeah, uh, yeah, and so you see actually skin lesions at the base of the hairs on the lower left. Mm -hmm. uh, I look at that, I think of another type of um, alopecia called um, lichen plano pilaris when mm -hmm. I see that. So I, I'll, I'll buy it for either one. In either case, you know, it's an inflammatory that in condition that becomes a scarring alopecia. And then um, the lower right, uh, probably supposed to be androgenetic. I mean, it's showing the parietal scalp again. Yeah, the widened yeah. part. Yeah. yeah, and the widened part is, is, is helpful. I think this is the telogen effluvium, supposedly yeah. hard to <laughs> find good ones. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, because telogen effluvium is, is, you know, you've diagnosed that in your clinic as you sort of pull away hairs, you get on a, on a, on a not a hair tug, but a hair, gentle hair pull. You'll get like two or three in every hair pull uh, telogen type hairs coming out. Telogen hairs are the hairs that come out normally. Okay. They're in rest phase. And so they come out with, you know, without there being like a root sheath around it. Uh, and that's the hundred hairs you lose each day. Uh, but if you can, you know, after someone has come in and, and probably, you know, showered and combed their hair, um, they've lost most of their hairs for that day by ju just doing that. But if you can produce more hairs in the clinic, uh, then, then there's a good chance they have telogen effluvium. Great. Thanks. Um, see if we can maybe get to, oops, so you guys, you guys definitely got this one. Great. Um, I want to give people a, an opportunity for a break before the, the next session. Yeah. And 
Um, but I think all of the slides, it sounds like will be available. If you haven't sent them to Javel yet, feel free to send them to me and I'll upload them to our digital curriculum site for everybody. Um, thank you both so, so much for walking us through this presentation and sharing your expertise. I don't know if there are any parting thoughts or parting questions from the group um, before we go on our break. Great, just a bunch of praise in the chat. So thank you again, mm -hmm. um, both so much for being here. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Let's take a five minute break. Um, we'll come back at 10.13 uh, to get started with our next talk on hyperkalemia. Thank you both. Thank All you right. so much. Yeah, <laughs> thanks Jessica.